Father, we pray that you will speak to us. We pray that you will open our hearts and open our spirit, oh God, to receive everything that is in your heart. We love you. We glorify you. We exalt you. Be magnified, wonderful Savior, even at this moment, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, glorious God. Thank you, wonderful Savior. Father, I offer myself to you, a God of hope as a vessel, and I pray that your message will come to mankind at this moment with power and with the great Spirit of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you so much, dear viewer. Thank you so much for joining with us again today. We are thankful every time that you can be able to get to connect with us. I pray that you can be able to host a watch party and get somebody involved at this moment and just let them know Kenny Upper is right now live so that we can be able to discuss the Word of God together and just enjoy what God has in store for us. I pray that God preserves you through this entire season. And I pray that God is going to cause you to come to the place where you thrive. You don't just survive. And you do not have uh, uh, come to the place where you become a victim. But you thrive. I pray that God helps you to thrive. Even as you're listening to me right now. I want to come to you right now, dear viewer, with a message on the reason for the season. I want us to understand that every time that there's a season, there is always a reason. No season just happens. Every season has a purpose. And I want you to understand that it is possible that Satan wants to seize the moment and cause evil. So that every season that you go through can actually get to carry out or effect the evil cause of satanic agenda. But at the same time, I want you to understand that the eternal God, the redeemer of mankind, the maker of all mankind has a divine agenda for every season. And that's why God inspired the man of God, uh, uh, Apostle Paul. And he spoke to us and he said that in all things, God works together for the good of them that love him. In other words, it doesn't matter how dark the moment is, God is still working. God is still working. There is a progressive work that is going on that is being carried out by the Redeemer God. The redemptive agenda is going on, and it doesn't matter what's going on. God uses every such season to cause something to happen on his agenda. And that is why we must understand the reason for the season. So today I want to come to you, and I pray that God is going to help us to talk together in deep thoughts that God has put in my spirit. One of the agendas of the season, one of the agendas of God concerning this season is that God uses season to season you. I want you to get that in your spirit. God uses a season to season mankind. God uses the season to season mankind. And today, I want to talk to you about the purpose of the season for the church. That God is using season to season the church and to cause the church attraction. I want you to get those words in your spirit. God is using this season right now, no matter how horrible it is, no matter how painful, no matter how biting it is, God is using the season to season the church, to season you listening right now so that God may cause your attraction. I pray that that gets in your spirit. I want to go right to the point so that we cannot be able to lose any time right now because I know that God has a divine agenda that he wants to carry out in your life in great power. God uses this season. He's using this season to season the church and to season you and I and cause attraction. Now, I want you to get this, beloved, before I go any farther in this, that God cannot be able to draw humanity himself Unless he attracts mankind. I want to say that again. God will not draw mankind to himself. Humanity will not come to God unless God gets to attract mankind. Mankind must be attracted for man to come to God. God must extend his power of attraction to mankind in order for humanity to be drawn to him. Humanity will not come to God in relationship of oneness unless God attracts mankind. 
Now, I want you to understand that God is attractive. That God has the power of attraction. But for God to access humanity with his attraction, that man must be attracted through the church. I wanted to get that in your spirit. In other words, God extends his attraction to mankind through the church. That means, therefore, that there is the place for the Holy Spirit. There's the place for the power of God coming through the Holy Spirit that attracts mankind to God. But there's the place of the power of redemption through the life of the redeemed. In other words, there is the place where the Holy Spirit of God can get to minister to mankind, where there's revival, the Spirit of God moves in a place, and the Spirit of God gets to minister to people through revelations and, and through all of this kind of visions and conviction and stuff like that. But there's the place for the power of redemption in the life of the redeemed that humanity is looking at. Because when mankind is coming to God, they're coming to a redeemer. And when man wants to come to a redeemer, they want to look at the redeemed to find out if this redemption works. And so there's a measure of redemptive power that must be manifested in the life of the redeemed for the unredeemed to be to come to God. That's why humanity will be attracted through the church. In other words, the church must carry a measure of attraction so that mankind can be drawn to God through the church. In any case, you can never truly attract to your God Man that you've not attracted to yourself. I want to say that again. You are not able to attract to your God humanity that you cannot attract to yourself. And so because of that, therefore, there is a measure of attraction. There is a measure of attractiveness that God wants to bestow upon the church. There is the capacity of attraction that God wants to build upon the church so that you and I, may come to the place where we have the capacity to attract mankind to ourselves and so attract mankind to our God. I pray that that gets to settle in your spirit somewhere. I can begin to feel the spirit of God moving in this place. And I pray that you begin to see what I'm talking about. In other words, the question that you want to ask yourself is, does my life repel mankind from God? Do I contribute towards man getting hardened against God? Do I contribute towards man getting put off God? Do I contribute towards man getting attracted to God? Because I am the redeemed that humanity is seeing now. Does my life carry the capacity to attract mankind to God? Do I carry the capacity to attract mankind? When I talk about the fact that God has saved me, does that make somebody begin to feel drawn to God? Or does that make somebody get repelled from God? Because I don't carry the capacity to attract mankind to God. Hallelujah. Now I want to show you a scripture portion in the Bible. That's going to help you understand what I'm talking about. This is concerning the early church. If you look at the book of Acts chapter number 2. And verse number 46 to 47. And then I'm going to go to Acts chapter number 5. But number 13 to 14. So if you're there with your Bible. Then you can go with me. I want to show you thought that, that will help you understand what we're talking about right now. In chapter number 2 of the book of Acts. If you look at verse number 46. Bible talks about the early church and how the early church were devoted to God. If I begin from verse number 42, the Bible said that they, de they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. In other words, they devoted themselves to the word of God and they devoted themselves to fellowship. Now look at the next word. To the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. And the scripture
sorry beloved for that interruption i was reading the book of acts chapter number two and verse number 46 to 47 we're talking about the fact that the church must carry the power of attraction that for us to truly be able to win humanity back to god we must carry the capacity to attract mankind that is the key thing that i wanted to see and that is the key thing that we're seeing in the early church that they carried capacity to attract mankind and so in verse number 47 we see that praising god and enjoying the favor of all the people look at a church that is in a community and even though she may not be preaching what people want to hear, but she's set in such a way that it, it, she's enjoying the favor of all the people. Why? Because she carries attraction. You cannot deny that these people have been touched by the power of God. You cannot deny that their lives are carrying the result of redemption. In fact, there came a time that the Bible talks about how Peter and John raised a cripple in chapter number 3. And the Bible says that the Sanhedrin and the authorities could not deny that these people had met with the Christ. That's in chapter number 4. They could not deny when they saw that these were people that were unschooled and they saw their boldness, and they saw the authority, and they saw the power, they could not deny that these people had been with Christ. And so humanity was able to see a people that carried something unique. They were truly peculiar, and everybody longed to be part of them. And so because of that, therefore, they won the favor of humanity because they carried the power of attraction. You could not dismiss the church. You could not dismiss the members. There was something they were experiencing. There was something that they were in contact with. You could not dismiss them. They were not dismissible like the present day church. And so, if you look at chapter number 5, the Bible talks about this word. The Bible says in verse number 12 to 14, he said, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. But number 13, no one else dared join them. You don't just join them. So no one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. I want you to see that. The church was highly regarded by the people. So even though people never dared to join them, they were highly regarded because they carried attraction. They carried something that you could not dismiss. Now look at the next word, verse number 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So the thing that I'm trying to make you understand before I go any further in this, beloved, is that God has bestowed the power of attraction upon the church. Capacity of attraction. And that's the reason for the season. God seasons the church so that she may carry attraction power. That she may build capacity of attraction. Now watch this. One of the factors of attraction, one of the factors that will cause attraction to God, watch this, is the taste of God. I pray that this begins to make you begin to understand what God is saying to you right now. The taste of God. In other words, God has a taste. God has a taste. In other words, when mankind comes to God, mankind comes to God to, to consume. Just allow me to use that word. In other words, relationship with God is a relationship of consumption. When we come to God, we are coming to a savior. We are coming to a God that will feed us on his saving grace and his saving power. We are coming to a God that will feed us on his redemptive power. So that when we come to God, God is going to redeem our lives and change our lives and save our lives. When we come to God, we come to a God who becomes our help. So we will be helped by God. 
when we come to God, we come to a God that will give us joy out of gloom. When we come to God, we come to a God that will give us the peace of God. We are coming from a world full of turmoil, but when we come to God, God gives us peace. God fills us with love. We are coming from a world of hate, but when we come to God, he feeds us on his love. God feeds us on his life. God gives us his light. God gives us his power. God gives us his strength. And so when we come to God, we are coming to a relationship of consumption. We're coming to feed on something that God is going to invest upon our life. And so because the relationship with God is a relationship that is based on consumption, therefore, appetite is important. In fact, you need to understand that always the driving factor concerning consumption or the driving factor behind consumption is appetite. You can never consume if you don't have appetite. But what causes appetite is always the taste. So when humanity hears the gospel of Christ, when mankind gets to hear the call of God, saying, come, that you may be saved, they hear the echoes of coming to God for solution. God is going to provide solution. Their lives are going to be fed on something from God. God is going to provide solution to their sick life, to their messed up life, to their lost life. And so they're coming to consume. But consumption is driven by the power of appetite. And appetite is always based on taste. Now listen to me carefully, beloved. That's where the key thing is. If you look at the book of Psalm 32 and verse number 8, the psalmist David says, come. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Say, you must have a taste of God so that you can see that God is good. In other words, what will cause you to have appetite for God so that you can consume, so that you can build this relationship, so that you can be a man of prayer, a woman of prayer, a man and woman of the word of God, invested in the kingdom, established in the kingdom of God. For you to come there, it's going to be necessary that you have appetite. But for you to have appetite, there must be a taste. Now, God has bestowed his taste upon the church so that humanity cannot taste God any other way. The only way for humanity to have a taste of God is through contact with the church. It is when humanity comes into contact with the church that humanity has a taste of God. That's why God has invested upon the church all of the instruments of tasting God. All of the instruments. The church is supposed to be the carrier of the presence of God. And when I talk about the church, beloved, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about the person. I'm talking about the people. I'm not just talking about a building. I'm talking about the people. I'm not talking about denomination. I'm not talking about congregation. When I'm talking about the church, I'm talking about you. God has bestowed, God has bestowed all of the instruments that carry the taste of God. He has bestowed upon the church. God has given us, as the church of Christ, as individuals, as persons, God has given us the presence of God, the glory of God. We are the ones that are called to carry the person of God, to carry the presence of God, to carry the glory of God, to carry the power of God. We are the ones that are called to carry the glory of God, the presence of God. And we are not given the presence of God just for ourselves. People that have carried the presence of God. You walk in a place and somebody can sense God around your life. And I pray that that becomes your dream, beloved. That you become somebody that's so obsessed with a desire to carry the presence of God. Until you affect the people. But when you enter an atmosphere, enter a place, the atmosphere changes because of the presence that you carry. When you look at a man called Moses... The Bible talks about Moses in the book of Exodus chapter number 33. 
The Bible said that every time that Moses went to the tent of meeting to meet with God, that when he entered the tent of meeting, the glory of God, the luminous cloud of God's glory came and stood at the door. The presence of God came. The glory came. And the Bible said that all the Israelites came out of their tent and they fell down on their face and they worshipped God because Moses was able to attract the presence of God. He was able to attract the glory of God. He was able to carry the glory of God. And when he showed up in a place, there the glory of God showed up. And when the glory of God showed up, suddenly the people were touched. That is who you are called to be. You are called to carry the presence of God. But when you enter a place, the atmosphere changes. The ambience changes. The feel changes. All of a sudden, if people were gloomy, the joy of the Lord has come. If people were hopeless, hope has already come. They could feel the presence of God. When Moses came from the mountain, the Bible said that his face was radiating with the glory of God. And the people could see the glory of God upon him radiating from his face. That's who you are called to be. The church is called to carry the presence of God everywhere that we are. In the place of work, we should carry the presence of God. In the church, we should carry the presence of God. In our homes, God has called us to carry the presence of God. That is who we are called to be. And the presence of God is actually an instrument of the taste of God. The moment you carry the presence of God to humanity, that you are talking to somebody, you are sitting with somebody, you are communicating with somebody, and they can feel the presence of God, that is a taste of God. The taste of God has been bestowed upon the church. We are the carriers of the taste of God for mankind. And when we present the presence of God, and we present to mankind the taste of God. We give them a taste of God that causes them to have appetite for God, causes them to have a desire for the living God. God has bestowed upon us all of the instruments of the taste of God so that we can attract humanity. Hallelujah. I pray you get it, beloved. I pray that this makes you desire to make sure that everything changes in your life. That you become the person that God has called you to be as the church of Jesus Christ. We are not just given the presence of God. God has given us the fruit of the Spirit. We are given the fruit of the Spirit not just to feed on by ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit is actually meant to feed humanity. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of these things are fruit of the Spirit of God. So when the Spirit of God comes upon us, when we are filled with the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost takes root upon our lives, then we bear fruit. Hallelujah. And when we bear fruit, then we feed humanity on the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, when the Spirit of God manifests the fruit of the Spirit upon our lives, when we relate to mankind, when we relate to humanity, Full of the love of God. And man gets to have a taste of the love of God. They begin to have a taste of God. When mankind has a taste of the joy of the Lord. Not just happiness. Because happiness depends on happenings. But when humanity comes around us. And they find genuine joy of God. Upon our life. Then we have fed them on a taste of God. When humanity comes into contact with us and they have a contact with the kindness of God and they feel the kindness of God in our lives and we treat them with the kindness of God, they have a taste of God. When humanity comes into contact with us and we carry the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding and we carry it and they come into contact with the peace of God, the fruit of the Spirit. We have just given them a taste of God. When humanity comes into contact with us and we feed them on patience. Have, have you ever come into contact with somebody truly patient? Have you come into contact with somebody truly kind? And suddenly you are attracted to them because kindness attracts. 
Have you come into contact with somebody that truly is patient? That you can throw tantrums around them. You can do everything that you want. And they will still be full of joy. They have their composure. Because the patience they have is something from an eternal God. Something that's not coming from happenings. And so it doesn't matter what happenings are going on. What they carry is from God. And you have a taste of their patience. And you feel attracted no matter who you are. God has bestowed upon us instruments that carry the taste of God. That when we get to feed humanity on these instruments, humanity has a taste of God through our lives. And when humanity gets a taste of God through our lives, they develop appetite and a desire for God. They get attracted to God because they've tasted of the goodness of the Lord through our lives. The church is the carrier of the taste of God. The church is the carrier of the goodness of the Lord. The church is the carrier of the taste of God. That's why God has given us, has called us to be the light. God is light. But God says, yes, you are the light of the world. We are the light of the world. And light is of God. Because God is light. So the moment that we carry light... And we invade the darkness of humanity that is living in darkness. Isaiah warned us, and Isaiah said in Isaiah 60 and verse number 2, he said, She, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people. He was warning us that darkness is over mankind, and humanity is in pitch darkness. I pray that I'm talking to somebody that knows what darkness is, because today we're invaded with electricity in our cities. Even the rurals have electricity. And so because of that, we don't really get invaded, but the darkness that the generations past really felt. But humanity is under another darkness. There is not just the absence of physical light that we can see. Humanity is under darkness that is spiritual. When Isaiah said darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over mankind, he was talking about the kind of darkness that would cause the evil that humanity reels under today. And we are called to be the light of the world. God did not just say we carry light. God said we are light. God himself is light. But we are the light of God. And so God gets to extend his light to humanity through the church, through the redeemed of the Lord. So when we come to the place where we come to people's darkness, where somebody's confused because of what they're going through, when somebody's struggling with what they're going through, they cannot make head or tail of it. They are mixed up. They're lost. And you come in and the light of God invades them. Then suddenly they have a taste of God through the light in you. They have a taste of God through the light in you. That's what we are talking about in here. The Bible said in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5 and verse number 8, Paul spoke to the Ephesian church. He said, you were once darkness, but now you have become the light. In other words, before we give our lives to Christ, before we came into the kingdom, we were darkness. Humanity can be darkness itself, but now you are the light. So when you come to mankind, they're supposed to see and experience light. Hallelujah. That's who you are called to be. And so when God gives you his light, and when God makes you the light of the world, it's because God wants you to have, God wants humanity to have a taste of God through your life. You are not only called to be the light of the world, you are called to be the righteousness of God. The Bible says in the book of Leviticus 19, verse number 1, God spoke to the Israelites. He said, therefore be ye holy. For I, the Lord thy God, am holy. Peter gets to echo back to the church. He says, be ye holy, for I, the Lord thy God, am holy. Why? Because holiness does not just save you. It does not just protect you. It does not just help you. But the holiness in your life gets to touch mankind. Because sin is a virus from Satan. And sin causes sickness. Every virus causes sickness. That's why the Bible says that the sinners will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is the place of eternal death meant for Satan. 
So sinners are going to experience Satan's death. Why? Because they carry Satan's disease because of Satan's virus. Sin is the virus of the enemy. And so when we come to humanity, wallowing in sin, struggling with sin, and they're struggling with the sickness that sin causes. Everybody that's living in sin right now, everybody that's living in sin, that carries sin, that sin has taken over their lives, knows what I'm talking about because every sin causes a disease. And so they know they are sick. And when you come into contact with such a person and you are the righteousness of God, the book of 2 Corinthians 5 and number 21, Paul spoke this word to say that God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin in order that through him we might become the righteousness of God. And so God has called us to be the righteousness of God. And as the righteousness of God, when we come into contact with humanity and we feed humanity on righteousness, when we get to feed mankind on righteousness, they have a taste of the righteousness of God. And so we give them a taste of God. They are tasting God from the church. Hallelujah. God has given to us instruments of the taste of God. He has given us to be the salt of the earth. In the book of Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 13, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Now salt performs two tasks. Number one, Salt always preserves that which is rotting. And I'm going to tell you, humanity is rotting because of the fall and because of the evil that mankind reels under. Humanity is rotting. And so but God has called us to be the salt that gets to preserve humanity. And so every time that you do anything to preserve mankind, you have given them a taste of the salt of God. And when you give them a taste of the preserving power of God, you have given them a taste of God. Hallelujah. And salt not only preserves, but salt also causes flavor. It causes a taste. And so as the salt of the earth, we are called to give humanity a taste. I can tell you, humanity in its fallenness tastes bad. Have you met somebody that's murderous? Have you met somebody carrying anger? Have you met somebody that carries hate? Have you met somebody that truly carries meanness and selfishness that you can see this person tastes bad? When you come as the salt of the earth, you carry the flavor of gentleness. You carry the flavor of love. You carry the flavor of kindness. You carry the flavor of selflessness. You carry the flavor of goodness. And when you carry that flavor, then you give humanity a taste of God. A taste of God. And when you give humanity a taste of God, then you attract humanity to God. Everybody that tastes all these good things that God's made of us will always desire the God who has bestowed this upon our life. In the book of 2 Corinthians 2, and verse number 14 to 16, Paul says that we are to God the aroma of Christ. Aroma is a smell, but it's a sweet-smelling savor. And so God said that we carry the sweet smell of Christ. We are the carriers of the sweet smell of Jesus Christ. And so when we come to mankind and humanity begins to have the aroma of Christ, the sweetness of Christ. Have you gone to a place and you smell the smell of death? Have you gone to a place and you smell the smell of immorality? Have you entered a home and you could smell the smell of drunkenness, the smell of fallenness, the smell of defeat, the smell of depression? When you walk, God has called you to carry the aroma of Christ. And so when you come to humanity, they need to smell the sweet-smelling savor of Christ Jesus. That's who we are called to be. And so God has bestowed upon us the instruments of the taste of God. Why? Because God has bestowed the taste of God upon the church so that humanity may have a chance to taste God through the church. But now, I'm coming to talk to you about the reason for the season. Because the question is this, beloved. What if humanity is confronted by a church that is tasteless? What if humanity is confronted by a church that tastes like the fallen mankind? What if humanity is confronted by a church 
where somebody has been saved for 10 years and the same meaning as they had 10 years ago, they still have. The same anger they carried, they still have. The same negative emotions they carried, they still have. And so they can fight you. What if humanity is confronted by a church that is fighting the sinner? So that today, you can find in our prayer meetings, you will find that we are calling fire against the sinner. And we are calling fire against the neighbor. And we are calling fire against the enemy. And we are calling fire, not against Satan, but against mankind that Jesus died for. What if humanity is confronted by a church that is so mean that it does not even want to share the gospel with them? What if humanity is confronted by such a loveless church that we can concoct some kind of gossips and lies about each other within the church itself? A church that kills itself. A church that fights each other. What if humanity is confronted by a church that when you go to once, you don't want to go again because people don't even look like they've ever met with God. That is the reason for the season. That is when God has to come in to cause a shaking so that God may season the seasonless church. Let me show you something in the Bible. In the book of Jeremiah chapter number 48, God speaks about Moab, and he says these words in verse number 11. He says, Moab has been at rest from youth, like wine left on its dregs, not poured from one jar to another. She has not gone into exile, so she tastes as she did. In other words, God says, the taste of Moab has never changed because she has never been shaken. So the taste that she had years ago is the taste that she has now. In other words, God says that shaking changes flavor. And so when God allows a season like this, it is so that he may season the church, so that he may change the taste of the church, so that humanity may come into contact with a church that is truly church, that carries the flavor of God Almighty. That is the reason for the season. That's the reason for the season. That's the reason for the season. So that when God has called us to carry the fruit of the Spirit, I want you to understand that always fruits, sweet fruits are caused by season. For anything to bear sweet fruit, it always is a product of season. Every time that God is dealing with a church, that instead of carrying the holiness of God and the righteousness of God, carries sin. God has to take the church through a purging process. And that's what the season does. It causes purging so that the church may come to the place where she carries the flavor of holiness as God intended. When God is dealing with a church that does not display and manifest the light of God. The Bible said that light is a product of burning. If you look at the book of John, chapter number 5, but number 36, 35, Jesus spoke. And he said, John was a, a lamp that burned to produce light. And when you see that, that mankind has to burn to produce light. And so when God has called us to be the light of the world, and we are not producing light, God has to take us through a burning process so that now we can be able to produce light so that humanity can truly get to experience the light of God through the church. That's the reason for the season. When we are called to be the salt of the earth, and we are not salting humanity, then the Bible said in the book of Mark chapter number 9, but number 49, that, that people will be salted by fire. And that God has to allow season so that the church may be salted by fire, so that we can carry the salt of God to the humanity that's dying. I pray that you get this. We're called to be the aroma of Christ. But aroma is a product of burning. It's a product of sacrifice. This is the time that God wants you to produce the sweet smelling aroma on the altar of God Almighty in this season. That no matter what's going on, you can lay your life down and you say, I am going to be on the altar because I want to produce the sweet smelling aroma that is pleasing to God. Aroma to mankind. The aroma of Christ. I pray, beloved, that you understand the reason for the season.
that you are called by God in this season to be seasoned so that you may carry the capacity of attraction because mankind will not come to God unless we attract mankind to God. All of the instruments of God's attraction have been bestowed upon mankind, upon the church. You are God's instrument of attraction to mankind. You are God's instrument of his taste so that humanity coming into contact with you will taste God. And whoever tastes God can come to God if that taste is good. I pray that you get what God is saying right now. I want us to pray as we close right now. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that Lord of hope humanity listening right now may come to the place where we understand wonderful Savior that this is a season that is meant to season the people of God and cause us to come to the place where we truly present the flavor of God, present the attractive power of God, present the taste of God, that humanity will have appetite for the living God, even through the church. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, dear Father, we may touch everybody listening to me, every person that is part of the church. Lord, I pray that you will grant us to be rebuked where we have turned humanity away from God, where we have shut the gates of heaven from mankind, where we have been a people that were never sold, a people that never produced light, a people that never sorted the earth. I pray, Father, that you will grant your mercy upon our life and help us, our Father, to rise up to the occasion and know that beyond this, you're producing a church that will truly attract mankind to God Almighty. I bless you, I honor you in Jesus' name. I want to pray for you who want to give of your substances, of your tithes and your offerings. I do not want to leave you out because you know how you're walking with God. And you know how God favors you when you relate to God through giving. Giving is a product of loving, so never wait for somebody to compel you. In fact, never allow anybody to manipulate you into giving, including me. If you would feel mani manipulated, don't give. It's a, a product of loving. You give because you love God. And so I'm just praying with somebody that wanted to give, not somebody that feels fixed because you've listened. You don't have to give because you're feeling fixed. You're giving because you love God. You know how you're relating to God. Our numbers are there, and we can be able to relate to you in case you want to inquire further. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for everybody that is set to give to you of their substances, their tithes, their offerings, their fast fruits, everything that we want to give to you, even in this season. Lord, I pray that you may open the heavens over the lives of your people and cause your blessing to come upon everybody in power, in the name of Jesus Christ, for your glory, in Jesus' name. I want to pray for somebody who wants to give your life to Christ. You have managed to watch this all through. It's possible maybe you never even understood the nitty gritties of things. It's possible that you have also interacted with some Christian and instead of them attracting you to God, they repelled you. But you're wondering, okay, how can I become the kind of Christian that God called me to be? And you truly want to give your life to Christ. I want to pray for you so that God may save you right now. So just say this word. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that you are the only Savior of the world. And so I give my life to you today. And I ask you to save me. Forgive me for every sin. And receive me. I receive you today in my life as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. You prayed that prayer and believe it. You've given your life to Christ. Now please get to communicate with us or somebody that you know that truly is a church that can be able to raise you up so that you can be built and taken to the next level. God bless you. I love you so much. My name is Kenny Upper. We're going to meet again on Saturday. Please send your Q&A. Send your questions so that we can be able to have the Q&A service on Saturday at 12.30. God bless you so much. We love you. Amen.